Obama's vision and our mission. We're pleased to join with the Peace Action Fund of New York State and the other sponsors in presenting this special event. The New York Society for Ethical Culture was instituted back in 1876 to be a place where action is more important than promises, where deeds are more important than creeds, and where we can spend time together seeking our highest aspirations. Our history in includes joining with others to establish the NAACP, the ACLU, the Legal Aid Society, the New York Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment, and many more. Our members have long had a tradition of advocacy on civil liberties and human rights issues. We built this building 100 years ago, and we're celebrating that this year. So there are many special events. Please look at the table we have outside with flyers of what's coming up here at the New York Society. Every month, we have events, discussions, classes, and help you learn how to lead a more ethical life, which is certainly something needed today. So please check the flyers and sign up for our mailing list and come back and visit us again. Uh, and by the way, if you made a donation on your way in, we thank you very much. And if you didn't make a donation on your way in, we'd certainly thank you if you made a donation on your way out. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to introduce Donald Schaefer, the treasurer of the Peace Action Fund of New York State. Please welcome Donald Schaefer. Good evening and welcome all. Uh, I am also the chair of the Dara Schaefer Memorial Lecture Series Committee, which is sponsoring this event tonight. Doris and I were married for one week shy of 60 years. She was a most remarkable woman, wife, mother, grandmother, a professor of history at Nassau Community College, faculty union president, board member of the New York Civil Liberties Union, volunteer at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and a longtime supporter of The Nation magazine. This lecture series was created to honor her memory in recognition of her unique contribution to family devotion, serious academic commitment, and progressive social action. The lecture series is co-hosted by the Peace Action Fund and the Nation Institute, and it's been made possible by the financial contributions of more than 150 persons it could even be more. But one deserves special mention. A good friend, Herb Kurz, who just celebrated his 90th birthday, pushed the idea, made possible the fundraising effort with a substantial grant and annual installments for five years. So the Dara Schaefer Lecture Series will continue to inform and educate for at least the next four. Thank you, Herb Kurz, and all. And all of the contributors. And thanks to all the co-sponsors of tonight's discussion: the Ethical Culture Society, Public Concern Foundation, The Nation Magazine, Haymarket Books, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, the Peace Action Education Fund and united for peace and justice. I can't resist one bit of trivia. President Obama must have been surely delighted to learn of our discussion tonight. And we want to thank him for, for timing the signing of the START agreement to coincide with this event. And now, please join me in welcoming the most extraordinary people that we have for the panel this evening. 
Phil Donahue, whom you will remember as that inspiring and progressive TV host, Dan Ellsberg, Jonathan Schell, and Kenneth Benedict. Pleasure to serve as your uh, moderator this evening. I come to you with the hope that some of you have recognized me. Um, the guy in the lobby said, Hey, Merv. Well, we're here uh, only to talk about the possible end of the world, and uh, we have some real superstars to come to wade right into this uh, hugely important and recently uh, very current topic. After the Cold War, nuclear danger seemed to many a thing of the past, but soon we learned otherwise. In April of last year, President Obama declared, quote, Clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of the world without nuclear weapons. Since then, there's been a virtual traffic jam of events in the nuclear arena. Just today, Obama and President Medvedev of Russia signed a new arms control agreement. Next week, Obama will host a nuclear security summit with the heads of state of 40 nations, and China's Hu Jintao may uh, actually has agreed to come. And the administration just released its roadmap for nuclear policy, the Nuclear Posture Review. Following hard on the heels of this will be the review conference for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a kind of roadmap for the world in the nuclear area. Have we reached a turning point in the nuclear story? Have we reached a turning point that is a, a fork in the road with ominous consequences regarding the decisions we make now. Has the long deferred dream, nuclear disarmament, come within reach? Or, on the contrary, is a new and terrifying age of multiplying nuclear dangers upon us? To help us answer these questions, I will be asking Jonathan Schell, the Doris Schaefer Peace Fellow at the Nation Institute, peace and disarmament correspondent for the nation, author of 13 books, including Fate of the Earth and The Unconquerable World. He is certainly uh, the son my mother wanted to have. He is, uh, <clears throat> he is currently a visiting lecturer at Yale College, where his class on the nuclear age has, been a, has seen a spike in attendance, suggesting maybe there is a renewed engagement on the part of students with this issue. We're pleased you're here, Jonathan, and we're grateful that you have found time to bring your expertise to this panel. Kenneth Benedict has long championed against weapons of mass destruction from her current role as the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists to her job as the director of international peace and security for the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, where she also served as senior advisor to the president. From 2003 to 2005, she co-chaired the Peace and Security Funders Group. We welcome you, Kinnett, to our panel today, and we thank you for being with us. Finally, Dan Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg, who many of you know, is the man who photocopied and leaked a 7,000-page document, which later came to be known as the Pentagon Papers. Less well-known is Daniel's long engagement with the nuclear question. He has known it from within the government as well as without. As an advisor to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and others, he had the highest security clearance and access to U.S. targeting plans. A desire to tell what he had learned was one of the motivations for leaving government when he released the Pentagon Papers. Since then, he has been a close analyst of the twists and turns of nuclear policy. Dan, we're grateful that you're here. This probably ranks pretty close to the most important uh, moment of your professional life when you appeared on the Donahue Show uh, not that long ago. I'd like to invite each of these panelists to speak for five minutes, and we shall begin with Jonathan Schell. Following that, 
I will uh, we'll be up here gabbing, and then you will be asked to write your questions, and they'll be sent forward for your participation. Let's see if we can't set a record and get a whole bunch of people in this thing. Jonathan. Well, thank you. Maybe, maybe I will actually. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, I watched the ceremonies this morning, and I was very glad to see them. I was, uh, I'm pleased about the cuts. Uh, I'm glad that the two leaders say that they have good chemistry together. There are other things going on, so uh, we do meet at a hopeful moment, uh, but. Um, in the spirit of a question that my friend Alice Slater, who's down here in the second row, asked me, she said, okay, what's next? And uh, so uh, that's what I'd like to address, because at the same time as I was happy to see those cuts and the other good measures, uh, I have to say that I was, had a rather intense sense of unreality, because, um, of course, what's left when the hundreds have been cut are 1,550 uh, warheads on each side. And so I had to ask myself the question, how does that fit into this picture? Why are these two gentlemen who are shaking hands and whispering friendly words to one another aiming 1,550 nuclear warheads at one another uh, in the year 2010? Uh, what, what chemistry is that a part of? Uh, that would be some chemistry indeed if those went off. Um, now I know that the nuclear danger is not a parochial one, it's a universal one. Uh, but it's also a truism, and something that's true, that it is singularly an American dilemma. We invented the thing, we were its first users, and so far the only ones. We improved on it a thousandfold when we made the H-bomb. We pioneered the strategies that justified it, are rationalist, and now we are stuck with it. In some irremediable way, it is ours. In fact, it seems to me that if a thousand years from now people look back at this country, there are going to be two things that they remember us for. One is the Constitution of the United States, and the other is the nuclear bomb. And it seems to me that these two are in fundamental conflict. Either the tradition of law and peace will prevail and ban the bomb, or the bomb will prevail and ban us. And I think that's the epic struggle we are in the midst of this year. And at the end of one path is a runaway nuclear age, and at the end of the other is a nuclear convention, a constitution for the nuclear age, if you will, banning nuclear weapons forever. These are the fundamental terms of the choice that we'll be making in the years ahead, and I think that's what comes next. So even as we acknowledge this universal character of the peril, we have to face our own American outsized national responsibilities in the matter. And that's why I think we have to ask ourselves a basic question. <clears throat> why does the United States, why does the U.S. government in 2010, under the presidency of Barack Obama, want to hold on to thousands of nuclear weapons for an indefinite future? It seems to me, when I look at that question, that there are only two conceivable rational answers and that neither of them is satisfactory. Answer number one comes in a single word, deterrence but the word deceives. It said we need nuclear weapons because the Russians and other countries have them and we need to frighten the Russians off. But if that were really the reason, we would propose going to the Russians in those negotiations we've just completed and doing away with our joint arsenals or cutting them way below the numbers that we did this time. But we don't do that. In fact, the Russians were ready to go to lower numbers, but we, didn't want to, but we said no. <clears throat> In other words, in the arms control agreements, we agree and in a way propose that we be targeted with 1,550 nuclear weapons while also targeting Russia with a like number, our dubious compensation. Now that's a strange state of affairs I want to submit to you, but it is the truth and so much for deterrence. Is the reason then, and this is reason number two, the only other substantive idea that I think you'll find in the debate, because we need these weapons to deal with nuclear proliferation, but that can't be it either. No one can suggest a sane use for even one nuclear weapon in this role, not to speak of a thousand. So I come to a conclusion. No reason worthy of a rational person's respect has been given why the United States prefers to hold on to several thousand nuclear weapons in the year 2010 and indefinitely beyond that. And yet this unwillingness to surrender the weapons is the greatest of all the roadblocks probably in the world to achieving the goal 
advocated by the president of achieving a world free of nuclear weapons. Now, it wasn't always this way. If we went back to the Cold War period, <clears throat> there was a geopolitical antagonist armed with nuclear weapons. You might not have considered that a good reason for threatening the species with its extinction, but at least there was little doubt what the reason was. But now that justification or rationalization is gone. Stanley Kubrick subtitled his movie, Dr. Strangelove, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. But that is not the situation in our relationship with the bomb anymore. In this new relationship, love has died. Now sheer habit rules. It's a passionless affair. I won't pretend that we are in the most dangerous period of the nuclear age. That will come later if we do nothing long enough. But it is in its own way the most ghastly and the least honorable period. For now we hold on to these awful devices for no apparent, no articulated reason at all. Now this is the time when I'm supposed to say in closing that we need American leadership, but I'm not going to put it that way. 184 nations have already agreed to do without nuclear weapons under the terms of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Now aren't they the real leaders? What the United States needs is to follow them. We need American followership. <laughs> Maybe, maybe to grant us a little more status in these proceedings, we can at least be the leader of the followers. <laughs> the nine nuclear powers so shockingly out of step with the global norm. Let us then follow the international community in its journey to free the world of nuclear weapons. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and I'm pleased to be here. As the bulletin put it in January, we are poised to bend the arc of history toward a world free of nuclear weapons. And today, President Obama and President Medvedev have signed an agreement which will begin to bend that arc. We have now a U.S. president who is leading deliberately and openly in consultation with the rest of the world to bring us to a world free of nuclear weapons. April 1st, a uh, year ago, he and Medvedev issued a joint letter in which they said they would work together to bring down the nuclear weapons arsenals. April 5th, in his Prague speech a year ago, he called for a world free of nuclear weapons. Uh, in May, he began the treaty negotiations in which Rose Gottmuller uh, and uh, Ellen Tauscher have been involved assiduously for this uh, year. Uh, and in September, he went to the UN and called for strengthening the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and called for a fissile material cutoff treaty as well. That means getting rid of all this uh, stuff that makes nuclear weapons. But not only did he set these goals over the past year, he's also begun to take action, and as Phil said, in a way that's almost dizzying this week. He just, uh, we've just seen the issuing of a nuclear posture review, which is the nuclear doctrine of the United States. And in contrast to the Bush administration, it's an extraordinary document. It says that no longer are, are weapons needed to uh, counter major powers, but in fact, the biggest threat we have is from terrorists and from those who can get very small quantities of nuclear material. Nuclear weapons don't do us much good in that situation. In fact, uh, they can be even har more harmful than good. Uh, in that nuclear posture review, we have said that we won't use nuclear weapons against those countries who are inside the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty regime, who are in compliance with it. We won't use them against those who use chemical and biological weapons against us. This is new. The United States has never openly declared that it would not use nuclear weapons against uh, non-nuclear weapons states, uh, and it's been a, really a breakthrough. We are also not going to make new nuclear weapons. You remember the last administration was very keen on making new nuclear weapons. We're not going to do that anymore. And as Obama's uh, nuclear posture review says, we will address regional conflicts as in India and Pakistan, and we will continue to cooperate with the Russians with whom we share the largest, by far the largest proportions of weapons in the world. But no matter how bold and skilled our leaders are, they can't do it alone. And I want to follow uh, uh, what Jonathan has said. Uh, 
leaders need public support. We need to consolidate the gains. We need to keep pushing hard to make sure that these weapons get down to near zero, that we prohibit nuclear weapons. We prohibit them. We prohibit the owning of them and the use of them. We've seen the greatest progress on nuclear disarmament when the public's been involved. In 1963, the test ban treaty was brought into place, and much of it was because of the protests and the nuclear disarmament movement of the 1950s. You'll remember that, um, some of you will anyway, um, that uh, breast milk was, contained strontium-90. The atmospheric testing was harming human beings, and people were disturbed and made their leaders know. In the 1980s, the freeze movement and peace action worked against the buildup that Reagan, Ronald Reagan was putting in place. And I'd like to say that at that time, it was a young um, Columbia student, uh, Barack Obama, or maybe Barry at that time, who wrote in the Sundial an, art, an article about nuclear disarmament. So that even in the midst of those protests, he was being educated in a way. And, and that education is what is serving as the basis for all of his actions uh, in, in his presidency. Um, in 1991, George H.W. Bush uh, unilaterally drew down many of our forces, especially in Europe, at the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union. And he was said to have heard, uh, he was heard to have said something about, well, I sure hope that they will do something about that damn clock now. The doomsday clock, which was, uh, I am the keeper of now, was in fact part of the culture. People understood that in order to get the doomsday clock moving in the hand back from midnight, you had to do something about nuclear weapons. So even George H.W. Bush knew about the clock and was paying attention to it in some way. The failure we had at Reykjavik in 1987 was in many ways because there was no public support. You'll remember that Gorbachev and Reagan came together. They talked about ab abolishing nuclear weapons. Gorbachev certainly wanted it. Reagan is said to have wanted it. But there was nothing, there was no atmosphere. There was nothing that, that really was propelling them to do it. The bureaucracy wasn't interested. No one was really interested except these two. So we need, we need you, we need all of us to be very active to make sure that we bring these down. Um, we need to also uh, change our way of thinking. And how are we going to do this? I mean, these nuclear weapons seem so abstract. When I talk to people about nuclear weapons and they ask a question, they often preface it by saying, well, I'm not an expert, but, you know, do you really think we need all of these? And um, I think, well, you don't have to be an expert to know that you don't want to be demolished by a nuclear weapon. This is about survival. Uh, we all feel like we have an opinion about uh, uh, health care reform, right, education, uh, and yet uh, not all of us even use public education, and yet we have an attitude about it, an opinion. Uh, we all have an interest in the abolition of nuclear weapons, uh, either because we're going to be the victims of it or, God forbid, because we will be the perpetrators of genocide if we ever have to use them. Uh, we have an interest. Uh, we need to know that we can make a difference. And I think the, we have the leadership now to help propel this movement towards a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. You're on. Thank you. I would say that the United States has not lacked leadership with respect to nuclear weapons in the last 65 years. The U.S. has been a leader in almost every aspect of the nuclear arms race during that time. And we continue to lead in examples of the use of nuclear weapons. And I'm not referring to Hiroshima here now. I'm referring to the use today, last year, and tomorrow. Now, that's in some contrast to the New York Times uh, yesterday, which said, no one in their right mind can imagine the United States ever using a nuclear weapon again. I would say we are using it in this very document, using it in the very same sense we've used it dozens of times in the past, and continuously to some extent, in the sense that you are using a gun when you point it at someone's head in a confrontation, or even when you keep it on your hip, whether you pull the trigger or not. 
And if you get your way without pulling the trigger, that's the best use that you could have of the gun in the eyes of most people uh, who aren't looking for deliberate homicide but just want to get their way. And in fact, that's why you buy the gun and why you uh, keep it on the hip or you point it. Every major candidate in the 2008 election used nuclear weapons explicitly against Iran. Every one of them followed President Bush when he stated that all options were on the table in dealing with Iran. And when a reporter asked him, does that mean nuclear attack? And he said, I said all options are on the table. President Obama, well, I said every candidate echoed that. Not Senator Gravel, not Dennis Kucinich, my candidate, not uh, uh, actually Ron Paul, who was very good on this subject, who said he was appalled when he heard his fellow Republicans uh, making that statement. The one, the one candidate who really made a, a real point during the debates of denouncing that idea, he said, I can't believe my ears. But in fact, uh, as the report was, uh, a smile came over Hillary Clinton's face as a candidate when she was told that Senator Obama had ruled out, had taken off the table, nuclear weapons against Pakistan, a nuclear state, our ally in this fight. And she realized she had him then on that point and made it clear, I don't believe you should ever tell anyone which weapons you will or will not use. In other words, it should be on the table on Pakistan. But Obama recovered from that gaffe by making it very clear that uh, they were on the table as far as he was concerned with Iran, and he has not moved from that position. So what we have yesterday <clears throat> is a statement coming out and, and uh, interviews by Obama in which he makes a point of, in effect, bringing up to date a little bit the Vance formula of negative security assurances as of, that was in 1978, that Secretary of Vance invited, uh, made that, and the only way it has been, quote, strengthened is that we no longer say it doesn't apply to a country that is attacking in association with a nuclear weapons state. A complicated formula, to be sure, at that time, which was meant entirely against the Warsaw Pact countries, in case East Germany or other countries that didn't have nuclear weapons attacked at all. Uh, we wanted to be clear, even though they were non-nuclear states and even though they were signers of the NPT, they were subject to a nuclear attack because first used by us because they were associated with the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union is no more, the Warsaw Pact is no more, so we can afford to drop that complication off and, uh, and simply say we won't use it against a non-nuclear state that is in compliance with uh, the NPT as we interpret compliance and as we decide what compliance is, a very controversial subject. <clears throat> Oddly, he links North Korea, oh, so he specifically mentioned Iran in this case. Also North Korea. I don't see anyone commenting on the odd coupling of those two. It's, more, it's beyond odd. It's absurd. Uh, there's almost no comparison between those states in their policies or in the threats they present, whatever, any more than there was in 19, in, at the beginning of the Bush, uh, George W. Bush II, uh, administration in linking the axis of evil and putting Iraq into that picture. Iraq, as we now know, having abandoned its nuclear weapons program back in 1993. As of now, North Korea is a nuclear state. So why did he have to mention that there was an exception for it when it came to a non-negative security assurance, which applies to non-nuclear states like Iran? I, actually, I haven't seen anyone make that rather simple point. Uh, I'm looking at Alice Slater here, who knows all these points. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. Has, has anybody mentioned that, uh, Alice? You're the authority on it. So, <clears throat> but in other respects as well. Um, in singling out Iran in the nuclear weapons, uh, the uh, nuclear policy review, which I actually read today on the plane on the way here, about 50 pages of it, <clears throat> I see there remains a narrow range of contingencies in which U.S. nuclear weapons may still play a role in deterring a conventional attack or CBW, chemical biological warfare, attack against the U.S. or its allies and partners. Therefore, the U.S. is not prepared at the present time to adopt a universal policy 
that the sole purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear attack on the U.S. and its partners. In other words, or no first use policy. We can't do it because we need to deter, in some circumstances, conventional or CBW attack on U.S. or its allies. Where does Iran come into that one? Are we facing a threat of a conventional or CBW attack by Iran on us or our allies? When did Iran last conduct an aggressive attack across its borders? Some say several hundred years, some say several thousand years. It hasn't been recently. That's not what we're facing then, is it? Is not the threat made in 2008 by every candidate and by Obama today a threat, all options are on the table, if Iran does not satisfy our criteria for its cooperation with the NPT, all options are on the table. And as he says, uh, Obama said in his interview, that includes military options, but it's not just military options, it includes U.S. nuclear options. Against what? I have to underline this. Against an attack? No, against possession or getting close to possession or in our eyes closer than they should get to possession. In other words, a preventive war attack. That is something beyond uh, what he's described as the purposes here. In the same uh, um, article, oh, it says, consider the use of nuclear weapons only in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the United States or its allies and partners. And then it goes on. It is in the U.S. interest and that of all other nations that the nearly 65-year record of nuclear non-use be extended forever. As I've been saying, there has been no 65-year record of non-use. NATO used it every year from its inception and is still using it despite the, the disappearance of the Warsaw Pact. NATO, under our pressure, has refused to go along with Germany's pressure some time ago, under Clinton actually, to adopt a no first use policy. And right now, Germany is among other nations who want all U.S. weapons off European soil. It's the U.S. that has been pressing for those weapons and maintaining a first use threat. And as I say, uh, that is a use. As President Reagan declared, the NPR goes on, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, but threatened. That's another matter. And preparations to carry out the threat even are necessary, even when those preparations involve backing up our first use threats with the possibility of a disarming strike against the Soviet Union, lowering damage, limiting damage to the United States. That is the purpose and the only purpose of most of the 1,500 weapons we propose to maintain. The notion that this is on the path that will lead toward zero is simply false, in my opinion. As many people, a number who are close to this process have pointed out, uh, very recently in an article I just read by Lynn Eden of Stanford, very good on this, you're reaching a floor which has been pointed out for years now that you couldn't get below 1,500 weapons without changing the functions and the planning and the aims of U.S. nuclear weapons. That's a floor. And what are those functions? Deterrence of nuclear attack? No. Hitting a broad Soviet, tar or no, Russian, target system. Command and control, missiles, bases, and troops. A tremendous number of the weapons go to troops as well as cities all of those, in order to limit damage in the event of war by a preemptive attack or a first strike attack. That is the function which has been there since the beginning when I was looking at war plans and writing guidance for war plans in 1961, looking at them earlier than that. That was the main function of most of our weapons and it remains true today. Quote, limiting damage, damage limitation in the event of preemption or a first strike uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, do you need 1,500 weapons you know, for deterrence, deterring nuclear attack? 
people say, mm, not really, you don't really, no, it doesn't seem right. That's absurd, it has nothing to do, that has nothing to do with deterring attack. Herb York, first director of Livermore Labs, once wrote a very interesting paper for Livermore, nuclear weapons production uh, design lab, saying, how many weapons do you need to deter nuclear attack? He said, let me go at it two different ways. He said, uh, how many weapons do we need? He said, if deterrence is the problem, is, the, is what you need. Ask yourself, how many weapons would it take to deter another country? Or put it this way, how many weapons would it take to deter the United States from attacking? Let me go back to the pairing of the new axis of evil, which only has two members now, Iraq having dropped out. Uh, North Korea, I think, in my opinion, is not under a very serious threat of nuclear attack from anybody, because they have the nuclear weapons, as the world can see, as Iran knows, as Saddam knew before he died, that he had made a mistake to attack the United States <coughs> or its forces before he had nuclear weapons. Uh, in the, uh, Iraq was attacked because it didn't have nuclear weapons, and Iran is under threat right now because it doesn't have them. How many would it take? I have to go on in here. I'll say very quickly. York said one, 10, 100, but closer to 1 than 100. Closer to 1 than 100. We have 2,200 now on hair trigger alert, point of the Soviet Union. Uh, we have some six or 7,000 on the shelf and altogether. The Soviets likewise. That has simply nothing to do with deterring nuclear attack. What it has to do with, we can discuss more. I've used up my time. But I'm saying, in other words, that, the, that uh, uh, Obama continues to lead the world, showing them that even the richest country in the world has interests for which it has the right and even the necessity to defend those interests with first use threats of nuclear weapons. That's the example and the leadership we are showing to the rest of the world. And that's why proliferation is uh, going to be very hard to stop. Do you have anything you want to pick up? Go. Do it. Uh, Phil has invited me to respond, being a quiet moderator. Um, Dan, I, I don't. Uh, I hope our audience won't be tired if we continue a discussion that we've had uh, over the years. But if I ask myself this question, why? In actuality, does the United States want to hold on to thousands of nuclear weapons for Obama's lifetime? Because he says maybe we won't get to abolition in his lifetime. I feel that notwithstanding hearing what you just had to say, that I don't know what the answer is. Well, I, in other I words, the, I well, know what the even, even in terms of a threat, I mean, you've made the great point that, uh, okay. that these are used, they're not detonated, but they are used in the sense of being threatened. But uh, what, what is the desire at this moment in history with no Soviet Union and so forth? We got there because there was a Soviet Union, no question about it. Now it's gone. What's it all about? I, I, I don't get it. I, I'm ashamed to admit it. I'm supposed to know about these things. Well, the... Um uh, let me, can I reply to that? Uh, as you say, this is a continuing discussion between Jonathan and me. Who, and there is no one in the world that I have more respect for on these matters than Jonathan, and whose passion against nuclear weapons is like mine, I say, <laughs> is the same. But there is a subject on which we, we disagree. It's not clear, though, from this point you just raised, there isn't that much disagreement, really. I'm not saying that there is a reason that makes sense or that really makes well, it what's logical. what's the one that doesn't make compelling. sense? <laughs> what? What's the one that doesn't make sense? I the, really, I want to know sure. why. Oh, yes. The targets, I, I think I know very well from what has leaked out and what is said, and there, by the way, a, a great deal more discussion of these matters than there used to be when I was working on nuclear war plans, which was very closely held at this time. Now, civilians have been working on this for a generation or two. And there's really a, a lot known about what the current plans look like, meaning they look like the same ones I looked at 40 years ago. And so I can answer the question with a great confidence. What are those, what are those targets?
for those weapons? Do they have targets or are they saying, gee, you know, who do we target? Uh, what do we do with all these weapons? Oh no, they think they don't have enough weapons on the whole. There are many people in the Pentagon who feel we really need more weapons. And I want to make clear, by the way, uh, this, this NPR, uh, I'm not saying it couldn't be worse. It could be worse. It probably would be worse under McCain and Palin. Even worse. Now that's setting the bar too low, in, in my opinion. But um, coming back, they would be, the targets though in this case are the same as they would be under McCain. And they include every command and control post in the Soviet Union. They include uh, all of the uh, air defense uh, networks, which are quite extensive, all the missiles, the submarine bases, and uh, most of the cities as a backup. So they have targets for them, and the idea is uh, as before, they're simply targeting them as before. Now, I will say this, and here's where I think we, we can agree very much. The rash, I could give you a rationale for why we supposedly needed all that for, uh, say, between 1965 or 19, and, uh, or no, earlier, from the beginning of the Cold War to the end of the Cold War. Now that rationale disappeared, so it's hardly worth mentioning at this point. We could, we could talk about it, but that really isn't there anymore, as you say. And without that rationale, there really isn't much of a rationale. It's a matter of inertia. It's services who don't want to give up their leg of the triad. It's jobs, in effect. Jobs, I just read the other day, by the way, that uh, communities in Idaho, in Montana, and elsewhere are objecting very strongly to the possibility that they may lose their Minuteman silos. And I think that has everything to do because of the jobs. That has everything to do with why they simply demerved the Minutemen, which was good in itself, down to one warhead, and didn't dismantle the Minutemen, which the Minutemen should have gone away 30 or 40 years ago. But they're there because there are profits to be made. There are people whose jobs depend on them. Right. Um, <laughs> And they're, they're there, and they're, they're not going away, frankly. They're not going away. Right. Right. Well, but uh, Dan, Dan, let me uh, ask you a question. That's not a rationale. You no, know, that may not be a rationale, but let me ask you a question. I understood that uh, in the treaty, we are, in fact, reducing our launchers by half. So, in fact, we, and they're easier to count. The launch vehicles are easier to count, so that's good, and they are demerved. So we are making progress. I mean, having the launch, number of launch vehicles means there are good jobs that are going to go away. The other, the other question I had is I thought there was an open ocean targeting now. I mean, they can be retargeted in three minutes, I know all that, but at least there's a stated uh, statement saying we aren't planning to use these against... Is Bruce Blair... Russia. No, no, oh, oh, by no means. Absolutely not. We're not planning to use these against Russia or not China. There are no targets in Russia. Absolutely not. The idea is that they said against accidental or unauthorized action, yes. so somebody at the lowest level, supposedly, mm -hmm. cannot independently, an individual, retarget those weapons away from the... Yes. It doesn't take three minutes, it's probably closer to 30 seconds to click to change those targets back to their pre-assigned targets, and the pre-assigned targets are in Russia, and also a number of other countries. So. Um, that's the, that, has, that has nothing to do with the... Now, on the question of having the number of vehicles, my understanding, and here I'm not on, up on all the details here, but what I've been reading lately is we are already below 800. The idea that we were allowed more than that, 1,600, these were vehicles we weren't using. But I think we're under 800, and the fact is that this agreement will not change the number of vehicles at all. No, but, but we've Dan, locked it into place, is the what? point. We've locked it into place with the treaty. Yeah, and, I mean, we won't go back to 60. And I, I think, I think Kenneth has a good point, because the after all, you know, there was a, a Cold War high of some 70,000 nuclear warheads. Yes. Now it's down, you know, by three quarters or whatever it is. It's probably comp not quite comparable figures on the, uh, on the warheads. And I, I noticed that people applauded when you mentioned the money, and certainly the money is always there, and the money will always win if it's not opposed, and yet you can beat the money, and even the reductions do show that. So I want to reassert my question. I feel it's still not answered. Why? What is the irrational, rational, or something else reason that we want to have these weapons? I wish I knew that, because I think it's the driving engine of yeah. the nuclear age. I am the point. least informed on the panel, and so it obviously has fallen to me to answer your question. <laughs> uh, 
I, th I think the numbers have to do with the disbursement and ensuring that all your eggs are not in black. And we're going to be safer because we have all, if they get us here, we're ready to launch over here. I, that's, that would be my guess. Well, you've obviously been studying the nuclear posture review because <laughs> that's what Lillian. they say. Uh, and you reject this as a... Uh, well, you see, the, the problem for me is that, uh, yes, of course, as long as there is a, I'm tempted again to say Soviet arsenal, as sometimes we slip and do, as long as there's a Russian arsenal, then they try to match it and you get all those uh, factors come into play. But since that is a negotiated figure, in other words, since we're deciding together with the Russians, the question isn't why do we have X number of warheads when they have X number, the question is why don't we go to them and propose none, or a hundred, or the ten, or the one. And Jonathan, I, I, look, I mentioned the people in Montana, but there's a more serious uh, interest group that work here. Uh, their interests could be, could be pushed aside probably pretty easily. The most encouraging thing about this NPR was the news, not in the, actually in the NPR itself, the Nuclear Policy Review, that there were voices in the administration for no first use, for sole use, for de-alerting the weapons, and even for dropping one or more of the legs of the triad, that is, bombers, missiles, and submarines. Now, the fact that there were people that, and they, over a period of months, were looking at that, is good. It's an encouraging thing in itself. But there have been such people before, not in the last administration, but before that, and they always lost, and they've lost again. So the first answer is that whatever the reasons are, they seem very persistent, and, and it's hard to bet, uh, to bet that they will cease to operate in the near future. If, if he couldn't get it through this year, then why will it be next year? But the interest I was about to mention was the service. There is no excuse for the Air Force to be operating land-based missiles, and that has been true for over a generation. <clears throat> but, for this, you, but there are promotions, there are people involved, there are training schools, there's doctrine, there's everything else, and the Air Force is not Please. about to give up the land-based missiles, despite the fact that being fixed missiles, they are targets for a Soviet preemptive attack, so that in the event right. of a false alarm, there are targets for the Soviet missiles, and the, the Russian missiles, and they are not in the ocean. They are in Montana. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth wants to I respond. Wanna, I want to remind the audience that we are going to encourage uh, your questions now. So uh, some very uh, conscientious people will be making their way. Please uh, think about let, writing your question and we'll, we'll get it up here. Let me suggest uh, two reasons why people think we still need nuclear weapons. Uh, one is um, they forget how terrible they are. Yes. They A forget how terrible these weapons are. Amen uh, to that. They, we don't remember, uh, and in fact, it really wasn't terribly well documented, what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the photographs were destroyed, records were taken away. The ones that we see are frankly sanitized in some ways. You see these uh, you know, vast wastelands in Hiroshima. I've seen some that were kept in a cave uh, in Japan, were recently released where there are simply acres of charred bodies, acres and acres of charred bodies. We'll remember the descriptions of the flesh falling off of people, of blood oozing out of people's eyes, of, of people wandering just completely lost, uh, their minds gone at the horror that they had suffered. When you go into a room with some of the people who talk about these weapons, and even in the ones, not even military people, pe my colleagues uh, in Washington, and they talk about these weapons as if they're bargaining chips, as if they're part of a game, and we need to have as many as we can because somebody else is going to win if we don't keep ours. Whenever I go and talk and occasionally in Washington and I raise the idea that we might want to think about actually what these weapons do, that we have enough destructive power now to kill nine billion people, there are only six and a half on the planet, people are going to, oh, you know, Kinnett, just, you know, what do you mean that's not really relevant? I think it's the most relevant thing we can be talking about, and that's the reason that I think, the, the other reason I think that we have, we still think we need these is because the rest of us outside don't 
say the emperor has no clothes. What do you mean we need these weapons? These are genocide. Eisenhower, when he was first briefed on nuclear weapons, when he, in 1954, when he first came into the presidency, he said, heard, heard what these weapons could do and said, these are not weapons of war. These are weapons of genocide. Eisenhower. <clears throat> And I think you, you may not mind being the victim of genocide because if you think the weapons are going to come at us, but I think many of you would be very disturbed to think you would be a perpetrator of genocide. And I think that's where we really need to hold our leaders accountable. We need to say to them, these are not weapons that we want to be responsible for. This is a democracy. We are supposed to be able to have a say in many of the things that go on. I know it isn't always true, but there are times when we need to raise our voices, and if we don't have the courage now, when we have a president who actually says that he wants a world without nuclear weapons, and I'm from Chicago, remember, I'm from Obama land, <laughs> um, he means it, and, but he needs our help. He's a community organizer. He knows that the community needs to raise its voice, and I think that's how we're going to get rid of him. We're going to get rid of them when all of us get together and tell our government and our leaders we don't want these anymore. Uh, I'd have to say I, I certainly agree to that, but I would say, as I said earlier, every president has not just needed our help on this. Uh, let's start with the, the current one, actually. He needs a lot more than our help. He needs our demand. He needs mobilization. That's, that's, he, needs, he needs action. When you go back to Eisenhower, I don't ha I'm very interested in that quote, and I'd like to get the reference uh, that he said that early on, and I can believe it. And Eisenhower, by the way, is the one person uh, who has testified as a high official that he, that he argued against Hiroshima before the bomb was dropped yeah. uh, to uh, Stimson and to Truman. And nevertheless, during, it was during his administration, two administrations, that we moved from targeting cities with Hiroshima-like weapons to H-bombs, for which the Nagasaki weapon was a trigger. So that by the end of his administration, and this is where I came into the picture, when I asked uh, a question of the Joint Chiefs over Kennedy's name, I drafted a question that Kennedy sent to the Joint Chiefs, and this is in uh, an article I wrote, you can look in my website, ellsberg.net, an article on truthdig.com in September of this last year. Uh, that when I asked this question, how many people would be killed if your plans, the Eisenhower plans, but this was under Kennedy, were carried out as planned? And the answer by the Joint Chiefs came down to 600 million people or 100 holocausts. Now that's not genocide, that's <clears throat> multigenocide, many multigenocide, it's 100 holocausts. In fact, as Lynn Eden is the one who's pointed this out, that was at the time an underestimate by at least the factor of two because it ignored the major effect of thermonuclear weapons, which is fire. It wasn't taken into account, deliberately too hard to calculate. But it also ignored nuclear winter. And it was 20 years later, as I think you were referring, or the 9 billion, 6 billion, 20 years later that we discovered, but that was 25, 27 years ago, in 1983, that the smoke from the cities we then, and still contemplate under some circumstances, hitting, the smoke would blot out the sunlight, freeze, uh, cause a, a drop from 20 to or more centigrade, degrees centigrade in the summer, freeze the water, uh, freeze the lakes, destroy the crops, lead to famine, possibly destroy most life on Earth. Not all, but most life on Earth. That's been true ever since. Now, that was regarded 20 years ago as requiring some thousand warheads, thousand. We had, you know, at that time going on 30,000 each. 1,500, it turns out it takes much less than 1,000. In fact, hundreds of warheads could cause that effect. 1,500 each is more than enough to destroy most life on Earth at the, at the, uh, on a hair trigger. So both sides have this. It has always, no president deserves anything other, no president, Republican or Democrat, deserves other than the utmost condemnation for persisting in this construction of a doomsday machine, keeping it on alert, and above all, in the last 20 years with the Cold War over, both sides, and the Russians too, and other countries for going along with it. 
it's not just us who are threatened. Every country on Earth is threatened by our plans and our capability. And which country can say its leaders or public have acted appropriately to use their influence to change that situation? I don't know of one. Some, some are worse than others. Well, we're going to call for these. Um, uh, you know, you can't get elected to anything today unless you prove you're tough. You cannot, uh, you can't get elected using the L word. The, the L, liberal is the political idea that dare not speak its name. So in this environment, at uh, $2 billion a day, the Pentagon, including nuclear, and the nature of our culture today, I don't know how the hell you get two-thirds of the Senate to... So are we starting from the wrong direction here? And by the way, we all know millions of people are going to die. And, you know, it just washes... You cannot tell a teenager, don't have sex, your head will fall off. Apocalyptic messages don't work. And I, as you know, I'm a brilliant man. <laughs> but I don't know how in the world you turn a population around you're essentially, you're essentially saying, if, if the mother's son has a gun uh, pointed at her son, and uh, the son has pointed the gun at his assailant, we're essentially suggesting that someone go over to the, the mother, go over to her son and say, honey, put the gun down, we'll all be safer. You know, it's just not going to happen. I'll tell you what could be demanded and what could be done. The assertion today is that this nuclear posture post review has the unanimous approval of uh, all the people involved. That's ridiculous. That is just, uh, uh, that's as ridiculous as was true as the Afghan policy. You had the unanimous consent of everybody involved, or the approval of everybody involved. That's just a, a common government lie that they always say. Now, when it says here that there are people who felt that this policy was wrong, that it should have been sole use, should be no first use, should be off alert, et cetera, et cetera, which, by the way, the president urged very strongly when he was a Kennedy. Uh, we should hear who those people are. They should be called to Congress to testify and give us their reasons and the estimates that they base that on, the ones who are against this, and let the ones who are for it or think we should have more, let them come and testify too, and let's hear it. The fact is there has never, ever been an environmental impact statement of the environmental and human consequences of using even a fraction of these weapons. So let them come and testify to Congress. What would be the effect of using 1,500 weapons, or 1,000, or 500? Let me mention one last thing from that quote I was giving of Herb York. He said there are two criteria we might get to for the number of weapons you need, or should, should allow. I, I gave you one, how many are needed for deterrence. He said, here's another approach. Supposing you thought that there should, this is Herb York of Livermore Labs, later head of director of research and engineering in the Defense Department, and later an arms negotiator. Supposing you say there should be a limit to the amount of death that one person at the head of state should be able to cause in a matter of 24 hours or 48 hours. And let's say the limit is something like World War II, put that at 60 million. That's as much as a Too person, much. as a plus as a certain, well, no, he said that's an upper limit. He <clears> said, <throat> how many weapons would that call for? He said, about a hundred. He said, at the utmost, if you made every bad assumption, so 200, it couldn't be more than 200, 100 to 200. This is at a time, we now have 7,000, we have 2,200 on alert. <clears throat> But right Dan, now. we are Can really I... talking about moving towards a world free of nuclear weapons. Well, I'm the first for, just about reducing this is, risk. This is the start. This is the start of a. This, this week we've got the nuclear posture review, the the um, the the treaty, this New Start treaty. We're going to go to a nuclear summit. We'll be out on Monday to talk about locking down all the material with 47, the first ever, the first ever meeting of countries to talk about how we're going to lock away all the fissile material. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, you know, Rose Gottmiller, who's a friend, who's the one who, was, who, who negotiated the um, New Start Agreement, mm -hmm. um, she was hired thinking she, this was going to be the, you know, the next eight years. She's going to be negotiating with the Russians for a long time. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. 
And I think we need to demand, yes, we need to demand, but it has to be in a framework that's consultative, where we all understand and we all agree, because if leaders can bring all these down very fast, they can take them right back up, especially if we're not involved in making the decision. So I think we need to understand that this is a global problem. It's not a problem. It is the United States as a leader. It, it made these things because they thought the Germans were going to get them. All of that is history. I think what we need to be thinking about is how are we going to make this happen? We have a terrific opportunity. Yeah. We have an opportunity that we haven't had forever. For 65 years. And I think it's here. time that we now think, yes, these are terrible weapons. We don't want 100. We don't want any. We want to prohibit. The National Academy of Sciences in 1997 issued a report in which it said the only reason to have a nuclear weapon was to deter another country with nuclear weapons. And they recommended, in fact, that we needed to prohibit nuclear weapons. We need to outlaw them. In 1997, they published, John Holdren, now science advisor, was one of the authors of that report. John Holdren's hand is in this. There are many people in the administration now who understand the opportunity and are willing to take it. 150 meetings they had to do this nuclear posture review. It probably took the Bush administration half a meeting. The point is we are arguing about this. We are really trying to get a grip on this. We're not just you know, idealizing about, oh yeah, uh, 100 or whatever. We are really trying to get to zero and to prohibit the ownership, the use, the new development of new nuclear weapons. And I think that's the task before us, and that's the one that I'm working on. Well, wanna, quickly. We, I will, I'll encourage, <laughs> I'll encourage our guests to be uh, he cut himself out respectful of, for the, of the clock, yeah, but we want you in, please. We've, we've got a lot of wisdom coming back at us here. I'll share it with quick, you in a moment. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, I, I mean, you're absolutely right to bring up the political question, and, and in the pr current Senate, how can you get even this very modest and moderate treaty through? Uh, but the fact is that when you turn to the public and uh, uh, ask them what they think about getting rid of nuclear weapons regularly and steadily, the public approves this. What there is, though, is kind of a lack of intensity. Uh, uh, so it's also, it's also, uh, there's no, there's no fear in the question. It's a theoretical, you know, it, you go back to the child, the, these two boys facing each other with a gun. I think that is as instructive a metaphor as there is. Can, can, if we love one of them, can we tell them to put their gun down? That's the question. Do we have the courage to do that? And how can we prove, if the gun is put down, that we will be safer? That's what this treaty does, and that's why talking to the Russians is so important. In fact, the thing that the Republicans will like about this is the verification. They've always said you can't trust the Russians, and there are very stringent verification uh, 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 protocols in this. Under the Moscow Treaty, there was no verification. We, did, we, weren't even, we couldn't talk to the Russians. We couldn't be in, in, in there and inspect. The, this treaty calls for robust inspection. We will get to go and see what's there. And the Republicans have always said they wanted that. Hold them to that. Yeah. Hmm. And like yeah, 1500, I have to tell you that uh, there was a um, Mary Tyler Moore episode in which Lou Grant, the, the news director, was dating a, a divorced woman. And she had been divorced some t for some time, and he was concerned that she might be that kind of woman. And Mary said, oh, Mr. Grant, how many men does a woman have to have before she's that kind of woman? And he said, six. <laughs> how many nukes does a nation have to have? <laughs> so it can call itself a safe nation. Three. Pick a number. Now when you say that, you're a, a hypocrite immediately. How can I have three and I'm telling you you can't have any? But, you know, if we got to three, is that, is that a, a step forward? No. That's not enough. No, because these, a whole class of weapons are genocidal weapons. We have outlawed genocide. We need to outlaw weapons that are... So you want them all dead? Oh, oh, of course we do. We all do. We do. Well, Would you take this as an interim step? Is that a possibility? Well, on the way down, sure. I mean, it's, we've got to get down. But we remember, as Jonathan said, we've been at seven, as many as 70,000 just in 1986. We're down now to 
a little over 20,000 between the Russians and us. We're more than halfway there. Mm -hmm. So we've been working steadily, and I think we've just, well, we got to keep our eye on know, the ball. It's going to get harder. It's going to get and harder. If we, if we eliminate all nuclear warheads, we have to throw away all our submarines, don't we? Our nuclear sub our Trident submarines. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it's another roadblock. I mean, you've got a lot of jobs here. What's, what's not going to happen very soon, it would appear, what's not going to happen very soon, it would appear, is that the Air Force is going to allow itself, for which I used to work, by the way, at the Rand Corporation, uh, but the Air Force is not going to allow itself to go out of the nuclear business. And if you get well below the, the targeting of all of those targets, which require land-based missiles in part to go after them, the Air Force is out of the business, and that's a reason, Jonathan, why you don't go down. Now, it's not a rational reason from the point of view of the world interest or national interest, but they don't need, it turns out, you don't need a very strong strategic rationale. Uh, with the Cold War over, you didn't have it anymore. I'll give you one right now, by the way. Oh, no. The situation, basically, obviously, I, I agree with Kenneth uh, very strongly on nearly everything she said, except I have to draw attention to the, to the fact Rose Gottemuller is in the administration. John Holdren is in the administration. They agree with everything we believe, and they have had no perceptible influence on this document. So what I'm really saying is I totally agree with you that there has to be a grassroots effort. I'm saying it has to be essentially a grassroots pressing on Congress and on the others because we should not wait for and have hope. I don't have much hope. You know, in the Obama administration, without that pressure, the pressure is right. essential. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan. Jonathan, and then we'll go to the uh, question. Uh, I, I, I do think that there's hope in the promise that there could be a new political lineup, because another way of asking this question of why we have the weapons, and you're getting to it, both of you, I think, is to ask who doesn't, where is the opposition lie? And I see two sectors. One is in the people who went to school in the Cold War, who now are in the Pentagon, uh, in the National Security Council, the security agencies, and so on. They're sort of the conservatives of the nuclear age, so to speak. That's number one. Number two is the Republican uh, minority in the Senate. But you have a ter quite a powerful lineup on the other side. One thing is the sort of heirs of Ronald Reagan. There are all kinds of conservative people who are now outside of government, unfortunately retired. Uh, but who have come out strongly in favor of getting rid of nuclear weapons. And that's really given Barack Obama a certain amount of political cover in championing this. You have a president, that's a very big deal, who I think really does want it and would respond if things lined up politically. You have a public that is friendly to the idea if you introduce it to them. They're not passionate about it, they're not much interested in it, but if they could be got interested, I think there could be a lineup of the stars that could really beat this, uh, these centers of opposition, which are nowhere near as formidable as they were at almost any other point in the nuclear age. And yet, former, look, here is President Obama, or when he was not president yet, he was in September of 2008, saying to the Arms Control Association, keeping nuclear weapons, this is Obama, Keeping nuclear weapons ready to launch on a moment's notice is a dangerous relic of the Cold War. Such policies increase the risk of catastrophic accidents or miscalculation. And when we say catastrophic, we're saying double nuclear winter, two nuclear winters. I believe we must address this dangerous situation, something that Bush promised to do when he campaigned for president back in 2000, but did not do once in office. I will work with Russia to end such outdated Cold War policies in a mutual and verifiable way. And so we can assume with sure certainty that Rose Gullimiller was one of those that they mentioned was arguing for that de-alerting in this. Was the president? We don't know, but whoever was for it didn't get it. We didn't get the deal learning, so it remains. It's really hard to say whether Obama really believed in it the way he really believed in the public option and just couldn't get it, or, uh, or whether he just couldn't get it. But if he couldn't get it, then something has to change in the situation, and it has to be outside the executive branch. Yeah. Um, let's go to these now. It, it is a curiosity that all those bomb throwers, when they get out of office, uh, they come down four square in favor of denuking the world, getting rid of all. Reagan 
Kissinger. Um, who are some Schultz. of the other? Schultz. 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 You know, it's yeah. funny. They yeah. get out of office and suddenly they're Mother Teresa. And, you know, and that is, that is, I think, very telling. Explain why the pro-nuclear faction of the Obama administration disagrees. Uh, explain why the Obama disagrees with Henry Kissinger that nuclear weapons are obsolete. You know, I mean, we I should demand that here. they explain, that Pardon? they explain. The people who agreed with the Gang of Four, in other words, for no first use and so forth, should be telling us why. That doesn't take too much uh, explanation. And the people who are against it should be really coming out. We should be demanding that they testify why, what their argument is for opposing this. Why, when you look at the disregard by the government toward international law, what would prevent us from disregarding our own policy? You know? If, you know, what's, who is the next president that's going to stand up and say, I've got to protect the people? And we certainly can't afford Actually, to obey the quaint ideas in this Constitution. In, in, in one of the uh, passages in the Nuclear Posture Review, after saying that uh, the United States would have a no first use policy against most countries, it gave a little out there and said if things change, the assurances could change as well. So they gave themselves a little exit strategy there. Yeah. If the posture stayed exactly the same, there'd be very little reason to believe it. But, uh, by the way, I give George H.W. Bush, I'll lose some people in the audience here uh, when I say this, I, but nevertheless, I have no question about it. I give George H.W. Bush, the father, great credit for getting nuclear weapons off our surface ships and off, and uh, many of them, many of them out of, out of Europe a great deal, and getting, uh, lowering the alert level. That was that much less uh, possibility of accident and made it possible, which would not have been otherwise possible, for Gorbachev to get the weapons off his Black Sea fleet and his cruise missiles. So that was a good move. We could be doing stuff like that now today, but we aren't. Mm -hmm. To what extent should we uh, worry about the nuclear arsenals of Pakistan and Israel? And to what extent will the current arms control protocols affect the nuclear arsenals and policies of these two nations? You know, those two are two out of three that have not joined the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, so they are completely outside the system. Uh, and one of the great anomalies of the current uh, state of affairs is that you have basically two arenas in which nuclear weapons are considered. One is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that's, of course, dealing with uh, proliferation. That's one. Uh, and then you have the Russian-American arms talks that we just saw the result of this morning. But left out of that is an array of nuclear powers who were in no discussions, under no pressure, just sitting there on top of their nuclear arsenals, and that's Pakistan, Israel, India, France, Britain, and China. That's fully six nuclear powers who aren't involved in any of these efforts, which is one of the failings of this nuclear posture review, because what really needs to happen, I think, is that the connection needs to be drawn between the disarmament efforts and the non-proliferation efforts. Those need to be brought into a single forum, which in my opinion should be a nuclear weapon convention, whose, uh, whose aim is actually to get rid of nuclear weapons, but you can have many stages and so forth. Um, So-called tactical nukes, uh, nuclear stockpiles, are not covered by START. What are the openings for addressing these critical areas? That they, by the way, Obama again is saying that he wants to bring them into the next one. That surely should be the case. It certainly is an insanity for the Russians to have 3,000 tactical nuclear weapons. It no certainly is an that. insanity for Russia for, for to the, what? To have 3,000 tactical nuclear weapons, and it's an insanity for us to have not as many, 600 or so, perhaps 200 in Europe. Now, uh, on the Russian side, we can lead by agreeing, by following the Germans, the, uh, let's see, Germany, Norway, Netherlands, uh, Sweden, uh, and a couple of other countries, Belgium, are all asking for those weapons to be removed, starting with Germany, by the way, for being removed from Europe. Now, by the way, I have to, there is an ominous aspect to that, to this question. Why are we resisting that? According to the NPR, there are some unidentified voices <clears throat> who don't want us to remove those weapons from Europe, that it would lower credibility. Credibility of what? Now, that really deserves asking, 
Who are these countries well, and what's Turkey, going on Turkey here? Turkey is ambivalent about that. They are not, there is a discussion in Turkey about whether to remove the weapons from Turkey. Um, and I think the other, you know, the, you know, the problem too is with France. They don't seem to be particularly interested in getting rid of theirs. But as Obama has said, the, the we next stage... We don't stage, have any in France. We don't have nuclear weapons. France weapon. has 350. After, after the United States They're and wrong. Russia, yeah. France has 300, China about 200, and then it goes down from there. <laughs> India about 100, Pakistan about 100, Israel about 200. So we've got, you know, thousands, and then we've got France, and China and the rest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the 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 question about NATO. I mean, the question is really about NATO, and they are going to be, uh, you know, undertaking a strategic uh, a, their strategic concept is going to be under review, and that is the place where we will, they will, and presumably the United States will talk about tactical nuclear weapons and what they're good for or not good for, and who wants them and who doesn't. But uh, there is disagreement, mm. and so I think that that's an appropriate forum. Again, it's, you know, you've got to, I think, bring everybody along. I think that's what community organizing is mm. about. You've got to, got to get everybody on the same page and get everybody feeling secure about but what's here, happening. If, can I raise that? Can I, mm -hmm. uh, who it is? I, I take your point about Turkey, but that's a question of the weapons in Turkey, that's U.S. weapons mean. in Turkey. That's and another reason they give for this is the need for cohesion. Well, as we know, Turkey wants to be in the European Union. They prize their role in NATO. They want a role of you know, being with the U.S. on this and so forth. But I'd like to know who those other countries are who are uneasy at the thought. Now, it isn't, uh, and we're talking about U.S. weapons now. So it isn't Germany, it isn't Netherlands, it isn't NATO and so forth. Let me make a guess here. It's just a speculation, and it's quite an ominous one, really, but I think with some basis. And that is that there is some of what Bush called New Europe here, uh, the Eastern European countries now in NATO, who might feel uneasy at this lack of commitment by the U.S. And what was it, uneasy even at the elimination of a nuclear dimension, not that they want to see nuclear war. But when it comes to deterrence, I can't think what those threats, those weapons could possibly be directed at other than the possibility of a Russian armed pressure, or specifically a Russian attack, as in Georgia, on an East European country like Poland or Romania. I, this is a speculation, but I think it deserves real attention. I suspect, from my background on this, which is, is long ago, but I've kept up with it, as you said, soon, I suspect that a major reason why we have to have a threat against Russian targets, which otherwise would make no sense at all, is that to maintain the credibility of a threat now, not against the Warsaw Pact, but against Russian pressure on these East European countries. And I, I see you nodding. I really haven't discussed this much. Now, that really deserves a lot of thought. The Republicans did say at the time of Georgia that we should be prepared to threaten nuclear war against Russian entry into Georgia. McCain actually said that, as I recall and others. In other words, he could conceive that they could be using, not that he really wants it to happen, but it's an aspect of deterrence. Do we really, should we be have on the table nuclear war with Russia over Georgia or the Ukraine? Now, you may say, well, that's absurd. I'm, Maybe in this audience Dan, that's I'm absurd, but I'm, not I'm, all I'm, over I'm, America it's not absurd. I'm, I'm, wary, I'm wary of that argument because uh, it, it, it seems to say that the um, uh, that we're, you know, at the end of the Cold War, we did not have these worries about Russia. And yet, in other words, there was no thought of keeping Russia out of Georgia. Those people scarcely knew Georgia existed at the time. I'm talking <coughs> about 1993, 1994. And yet at that time, we were unable to end the Cold War in the nuclear strategic sphere. And, and one thing question that all of these issues about the tactical nuclear weapons and so forth revolve around uh, which I think is basic to the whole issue in the world today, is why are we unable in the nuclear area to end the Cold War the way it has been ended in reality in the larger world politically and so forth? It seems that there's some incredible persistence or momentum that flows from the weapons themselves as if they had a quarrel to settle. Uh, after the human ones uh, have, have disappeared. So that's why I'm wary of bringing in a new quarrel, you know, with the Russians over Georgia 
as a sort of another justification. I get very worried about it. But by the way, you're not hearing me say that's a justification. Not, not that you feel that it is, but even to explain it in terms of... To say that some people are prepared to make that argument? They do. Well, they, they do. do. Yeah, I suppose they do. Uh, <clears throat> for, <clears throat> for the United States, are nuclear weapons a form of theological thinking, a secular expression for ultimate power, a guarantee for being a world power, a guarantee for manifest destiny? Consider the use of the word trinity <clears throat> in the early nuclear age. Jonathan. <laughs> you know, I think they are something like that, not for the United States generally, but for sort of a subsection. I think that there's almost been a, a kind of religion of power that has developed in this country. I happen to think that the Vietnam War was all about that, uh, demonstrating the credibility of the superpower and so on. Uh, the nation kind of learned those lessons, and especially even the military did, but then later in the, uh, really during the 80s and 90s, kind of, especially the 80s and then under George W. Bush, sort of de-learned that lesson. Uh, and I think that there is a notion that, uh, that the greatest power should have the greatest weapons, but it's not one that's shared by the public at large, which as I say, if you ask them, it's not very attached to nuclear weapons. It's more to these people, uh, mostly in the Republican Party or Democratic hawks in the Pentagon. So it's not a national thing, I don't feel. How much does it cost to maintain this nuclear arsenal? Want to try that? <laughs> can, can can it? A lot <laughs> of money. It, it is, uh, a, it is it a classified is. number, though, isn't it? Um, no, you can find it. Uh, <coughs> I, it takes about, I think it's something like a 26 billion per weapon. Per weapon. And I think that, um, that I mean, it's trillions of dollars. Uh, I don't have the number in my mind. There is a book, The Atomic Audit, which was done by Steve Schwartz, for those who like the details. Uh, it's a very, uh, very useful, um, uh, you know, kind of class by class. Uh, discussion of, of not only the manufacturer, the whatever needs to be, go into it, but also the maintenance over time. And that's the thing that we're really talking about now. Um, what, what do we do with them and how do we maintain the ones while we're waiting for all these things to happen? And also uh, remember that it's going to take money to dismantle them. It's the other, other thing we need to remember. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a freebie. Yeah. No, I, I, you, not per, per warhead. No, I, I don't think no, it's... No, uh, for missile and maintenance and uh, all yeah, the things Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have the figure, figures. Yeah, no, we're, we're all embarrassed. But I think Sorry. it's something like, uh, something on the order of tens of billions per year to maintain the nuclear establishment. Isn't Steve Schwartz's number on the order of three trillion over the... I think, over the I think it's I think about, it's for, the, for the entire expenditure, the I remember over from the, the atomic audit, but the entire expenditure... Uh, from 1945 down to the present is about six trillion dollars. Six trillion. Yeah. Why has President Obama increased funding to the nuclear labs? What is his vision of a nuclear weapon-free world? What if it gets us nowhere and only makes our movement complacent? I I'd like our movement to become complacent if we get to a nuclear weapon-free world. <laughs> I'd pay that price. Uh, I think the implication is that <laughs> You know, once you, get, once you get part of the way there, people will relax and say we're on our way and they won't remain militant in the issue of continuing the well, job. Yeah, well, yeah. I think that's a very good point because I think what happened at the end of the Cold War is that people did, uh, did uh, kind of phase out. And uh, I frankly have to criticize President Clinton uh, enormously. He had an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, at the end of the uh, end of the Cold War and in the beginning of his administration, to to uh, really do something dramatic about ending and bringing down the arsenals. I mean, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program was a useful one, uh, and has secured and dismantled many of the, especially the Russian weapons and ours. But it surely wasn't the kind of dramatic move that we're all hoping for right now, and could have been done when the Russians were eager to, mm -hmm. to cooperate it was, with it was us. was more likely to happen under, under George H.W. Bush, was it not? He was negotiating START II, it and it went into the ground under Clinton. That's correct. Yeah, I think it's one of the great mysteries of the whole nuclear story from the beginning, why President Bill 
Clinton did not take a greater interest in the nuclear question at that moment of the greatest opportunity of ever, which was the end of the Cold War that was presented to us. I, I don't know the answer to well, that. He was distracted. He I was asleep at the switch or, or, or well, distracted. Uh, <laughs> he was, his, well, uh, he was, his <laughs> attention was on domestic programs like Obama's, and he didn't want to fight with the military on that. Yeah. How much of this extremely inadequate piece of work here compared to what is needed. And I know I'm on the uh, side here of the glass much less than half yeah. full here. I'm well aware of that. But is, it not, is there not a factor here that Obama, to give him credit, has domestic programming, he had a health problem, he wanted to get Republicans, he did not want to fight with the military over Afghanistan or nuclear weapons, and he didn't get one. Mm -hmm. And so you say, why are the labs uh, getting all this money? It's a bribe. Yeah. Remember, too, though, that was, remember the big gay thing in the military? <laughs> Sam Nunn took him to a submarine. Look how close we are here. I mean, it was pretty hysterical. The last thing this new troubled president needed in the middle of this kind of environment uh, was to stand up and say, uh, yeah, we, we, we're going to reduce our stockpile. I mean, they would have, I mean, he would have been the wimp of the century, and he would have been a one-term uh, president. Would some, well, kindly speak to the issue of ecology and the nukes. We have a huge, turned on, millions of people in the green movement. What a partnership we could have here. What is a bigger threat to that than nukes? Yeah. I, I think that's a, I think that's a, a great t topic because uh, I think really what's happened now is that the nuclear question has acquired its proper and fitting context for thinking about it, uh, which is the wider array of threats that human beings pose to the natural foundations of life. You know, when the nuclear age began, uh, it sort of existed in a sort of gloomy isolation off by itself, this sort of uncanny and weird and forbidding and horrifying thing, uh, sort of a lonely peak. Uh, but now I think people can understand, since, since global warming and since the chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere and other global environmental threats, that it's really one of several threats to the natural world. And so I think that there's a, an opportunity here that should ab absolutely be seized uh, to place it in that larger context and to create uh, alliances. They've always existed. Uh, but, uh, but not to the degree that they should now. Jonathan, would you remind me, I asked you recently, and I, I don't remember the answer, uh, I was so impressed when I looked at the date of your book, The Fate of the Earth, which was 1982, was yes. it? Yes. And realized that it was a year before nuclear winter was actually burst on the world. Yes. And, and that here you were talking about extinction and all that before the nuclear winter. Will you remind me, remind me how you got onto that even, even then? Well, uh, you know, I, I noticed that each decade uh, of the nuclear age, and this has continued, uh, a new consequence or effect of nuclear war was discovered. So if in 1950 uh, you had tried to calculate the effects, the extent of fallout would not have been known. That was learned from the uh, bikini, not the bikini test, but the Castle Bravo tests and so on in 1953 and 1954. So. Uh, uh, that would have been unknown. The electromagnetic pulse, something that people still don't know much about or think about, the fact that if you detonate one of these things high above the atmosphere, that it knocks out all the circuits in a country. It's a kind of a wild card effect that they've never figured into their policies because they don't know what to do about it. Uh, and then came nuclear winter uh, later, a little later in the 1980s. But the fact is, the underlying fact is, is that when you set off several thousand nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, you just don't know what's at stake. And if you're discovering a new thing every 10 years, what right do you have to suppose that there aren't four or five other effects? And so it was never a matter of saying, well, every last person would be blown up in a nuclear war. It was a matter of saying that you'd entered a zone of uncertainty where the essential ecological underpinnings of life were so deeply compromised and threatened that it may lead to the extinction of the human species. And that was, I think that's the way it was, and that's the way it will always be until we do it. And then there'll be nobody to find out whether it was right or wrong. Just two years ago, I think it was Science Magazine, several magazines, and the references are in this piece I mentioned, 
uh, Planning for a Hundred Holocausts by me on Ellsberg.net, if you look it up. But the references are there. And just a couple of years ago, there were several articles on the effects of a small, relatively, really very small, a war between India and Pakistan. Uh, specifically, it didn't even mention the names, but it said 50 Hiroshima-sized weapons on either side, 100 in all, so, which is well within the capability of India and Pakistan right now. And the effect of that on the ozone uh, layer and the effects in letting ultraviolet then into the atmosphere, affecting the plankton and affecting crops and, and, and so many other things, and uh, cataract, has an enormous effect that would last for decades, a global effect, which is to say every country on Earth has an immediate interest in there not being an India-Pakistan war, and yet how can we possibly bring effective pressure to bear on either India or Pakistan when, as I say, we are leading the way in making nuclear threats when it serves our interest, yeah. uh, as we feel it does in Iran or right. uh, North Korea? Uh, couldn't we encourage Israel to at least come openly with it, uh, let us know what its nuclear capacity may be? Could um, we press everybody him? else does. We couldn't press it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, is it, is it well, really possible it, that we it, can't it, press it, Pakistan to get a Khan right. to tell us who else he has yeah. given nuclear weapons design to? Yeah, but uh, I, think, I think those are two different questions because yeah. of our relationship with Israel. Israel's now in a position mm -hmm. to help us move forward toward a nuclear-free world. Well, very but, similar. It really is similar. Both Pakistan and Israel, like Karzai, go on the principle that although they are totally dependent on our aid, Pakistan least of those actually, that we need them more than they need us, and that we cannot bring effective pressure to bear on them, in effect. In, in the Israel case, because of a, a lobby here in this country, uh, uh, Jews like myself, uh, but I'm, I don't happen to be part of that lobby, but uh, people who feel that uh, there should be no questioning of Jewish policy, whatever, or Likud policy, which is a strong enough, uh, just like, you know, on, on the Air Force on another issue, or you know, various interest groups. So uh, in, this, in the NPR, I don't believe the word Israel occurs. They keep mentioning, keep mentioning various people who have this many weapons or that many weapons. May I say one other thing too? You well, mentioned the Kinnett, number of weapons. Kinnett was, Kinnett was saying earlier that uh, the denial is a great feature of the uh, nuclear dilemma, which it certainly is. Uh, I think it's key, and we can't understand the dilemma without that, and without reminding ourselves, actually, as you did, of the human consequences. So I was very grateful that you did that. Uh, but Israel has had the sort of, in a certain way, brilliant idea of actually making it an official policy. Yeah. Our, our psychological state has been turned into an official policy of, of denying that they have yeah, but, nuclear arms, and it's served them brilliantly. So uh, the world is all excited and jumping up and down about Iran and North Korea, uh, one of which does not have nuclear weapons, the other may have one or two, and Israel, which has 200, is just never mentioned. And I actually think I did a search uh, on, the, uh, on that doctrine, and the word Israel it is not mentioned. It's not mentioned. I believe, okay. I, I think I recall well, doing that. Let I me mention one other thing on, yeah. that's come up already. 200 weapons. Is that what Israel has? Now, as Phil says, they haven't admitted having any, so, and they don't reveal what they have. Where did this figure 200 come from? Let me, well, let me, let me suggest where uh, it didn't come from. It didn't come from Mordecai Vanunu, who spent 18 years in prison for uh, his photographs of the nuclear program there. What Vanunu revealed was not that nuclear, uh, Israel had nuclear weapons because the whole world uh, knew that pretty much. What he revealed was that they had an enormously bigger program than even our CIA would admit to having known. And what he was talking about was four to six hundred weapons, but that was in 1983, and they've been building every year. Now, they may have been discarding some of those, but what's the difference between their having 200 or 600 20 years ago? Well, in ecological terms, both catastrophic and let us uh, let Israel explain to their people, as no country has explained to its own people, but let them imagine them explaining to the Knesset what the targets for 200 or 400 or 600 weapons would be, what the effects on Israel would be of using those weapons, what the effects on the world would be. But I, why do we so strongly keep to this 200 or 300? And let me make a conjecture. Because France has about 300. 
Israel is almost surely, in my opinion, the third largest nuclear weapons power in the world, not the fourth after France. And that's, that's a psychological thing that they don't, you know, to be ignored, you know, in all these discussions. And for Obama, like all his predecessors, to talk about an international norm against acquiring nuclear weapons, which applies to Iran or North Korea and so forth, yeah. with Israel not being mentioned, there is no such norm. Hey, hey. Can I, I think Kenneth wanted, you wanted to say. Let, let me just uh, talk, though, about why this, many countries do get nuclear weapons, why we got nuclear weapons. You'll remember, you'll remember your history that uh, we thought the Germans were going to uh, make the bomb before we did, and that's why we started out on, this, on the Manhattan Project to build a weapon because if Germany had a, we a nuclear weapon before we did, the consequences of that we really couldn't contemplate. The scientists who had come to the United States from Eastern Europe and it's, it's, whose families had been caught up there in that Holocaust uh, knew firsthand what might happen if German, Germany had nuclear <coughs> weapons and so they felt it was their duty to try and get one first. Um, same with the Soviets, they saw we had them, so they had to get them. Um, in the case of many of these regional conflicts, as we know, the reason people, people, countries, states, leaders, want these weapons is because they fear others. And uh, I think Israel is in that situation. I think uh, Iran may be in that situation. Many places are in the situation of being fearful. So we can talk about the numbers, we can talk about the levels, we can talk about the effects, but I do think one of the things that we need to continue to push on is the idea of regional, of, any, of security, of how do we develop relations among people, and I don't mean just leaders, I mean peoples, you and me, with others around the world so that we begin to develop a common understanding. Uh, it's not going to work for us to continue to be uh, kind of fearful uh, ab about each other. I think that's really going to make things m uh, more difficult. And as, you know, I think that's really what we're, we've got to talk about too, not just the weapons, but also how we're going to relate to one another in a way with peace and security, uh, as Obama would say, and free of nuclear weapons. The two have to come together. May, um how will nuclear materials, weapons, be kept out of the possession of terrorist groups and rogue states? Let's talk about, uh, this has been a state issue, obviously, up throughout my, most of my life, Russia, United States, which, which countries have the bomb? Now, are we at a place where we are obliged to say which groups have the bomb? We are. Would you kindly speak to that? Yeah, you know, it's in the very nature of this uh, dilemma that it's based fundamentally in certain scientific formulas and in certain technology, and it's absolutely in the nature of technology and knowledge to spread around the world, especially in the age of the Internet. And therefore, it was just destined, it was just part of the genetic code, and everybody knew it right back in 1945 that the hour would come when this information, this technology, spread beyond the borders of the big states to little states and beyond the little states to terrorist groups. And the best estimates that you can get now are that we're on the verge of that. You can't say when it will happen, you can't say who's going to do it or exactly how it would happen, but you've had colossal proliferation, especially surrounding Mr. A.Q. Khan of Pakistan, involving South Africa, Germany, Switzerland, Malaysia, Dubai, this global network, and which has not been shut down yet, even though Mr. A.Q. Khan himself may be out of business. So it's a little bit like saying, you know, you can't say that a particular storm is due to global warming. You don't know when that storm is going to hit, that nuclear storm from a terrorist group getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, but that day will come. It can come tomorrow, it can come in 10 years, and, if, and you can't say which it is. But there's one way to stop it, and that's to do the same thing that we want to do in every other department of the nuclear arena, and that's to get rid of nuclear weapons and their associated technology. You've got to roll it back on a global basis. When you've done that, you've really solved the problem, because the truth is 
that acquiring the basic materials for a nuclear weapon, which is either plutonium or highly enriched uranium, that step is really beyond the reach of a mere group. That requires a state. So if you get the states out of the business, then those materials are gone and they can't be diverted to uh, other people and you've solved the problem. So it's all one more reason to have a nuclear weapon convention getting rid of all nuclear weapons. Could, uh, <laughs> could the decline of the U.S. global, the U.S. and global economy uh, or the decline of the United States as a global economic power provide an incentive to accelerate nuclear disarmament? Yeah, take a swing, Ken. I, well, in fact, I, I wouldn't say this publicly, but I will. <laughs> I, I think that um, one of the reasons that uh, the cold warriors, Schultz, Kissinger, uh, Nunn, and Perry, uh, have come out so forcefully in their beginning with their Wall Street Journal article in uh, January 2007, uh, against or for a weapon-free world is that they uh, are seeing the rise of uh, China and India and understand that the United States may not always be preeminent and so this is the time to uh, ensure that other countries uh, are uh, tied into a system of the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, I uh, you know, if you, I've talked to Sam Nunn about it. He says, well, I, when I first went to NATO, when I was a young boy, you know, 26-year-old uh, congressional member, and, and talked to the, to, the, um, uh, to the soldiers there who were in command of these, I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, we're, this is terrible. We shouldn't have these weapons over here. So he, think, he tells the story that he's always been worried about nuclear weapons, and this was the time for him to speak out publicly. Um, I think, uh, you know, George Schultz feels guilty about Reykjavik, that he wasn't able to really turn the tide there. There are lots of reasons, I think, that they'll give. But in a, in a sense, as they began to see others rising, others developing the technology, having the capability, um, I think they began to understand that this was the moment uh, when others are becoming more capable that we need to really lock this stuff away and get rid of these weapons because they will come back to bite us. Um, mm -hmm. Despite the great, uh, we're winding down here now, so thank you for your brief answers. Despite the great efforts of the panelists and the key role of the bulletin, the U.S. voting public doesn't seem to be remotely engaged by this issue. How can we reframe these issues, um, particularly in light of what will probably be a multi-year jobs drought. Well, that's the economic question. Uh, yeah. uh, in other words, the pressure is going to be greater, obviously. Uh, yeah. It's going to be tougher to eliminate these jobs. I, you know, since the end of the Cold War, this issue, frankly, dropped out of the public mind. Uh, people just forgot about it. People love not to think about it for very human and understandable reasons. And they took the opportunity with a vengeance. Uh, but I think that there are two changes now that may, may be afoot and that may change the picture. One is that things are really, the pots are really boiling. There's a dynamism to the developments here, and it has to do with proliferation, it has to do with these, this new drive for abolition, with the Star Talks, the NPT, all of these things, all the pots are a boil, and it's developing and moving, and it all, also with the threat of the t terrorist acquisition of a nuclear weapon. So things are, are happening, it's in the news, and it's returning to public attention, and I think there's a return of public interest. Uh, the other uh, aspect which we've already discussed is the connection with, with ecological, uh, with, you know, the terrestrial, the planetary ecological issues, which I think brings this back in a new way, which will attract public attention, and I begin to see it happening already. Uh, Daniel, I have a question for you, and I regret we don't have more time, so I ask you to do your best. Um, you were inside and outside. Did the light bulb go on on a Tuesday morning for you? I mean, you have seen both sides of the street here. Please briefly tell us what is the emotional uh, reality of this kind of experience that you've had, well, when I, and the personal one. Yeah. Go ahead. 
When I first held this piece of paper in my hand that had been sent to the president, top secret, sensitive, president's eyes only, and, and I reproduced that because it's a very simple diagram in this article I keep mentioning on Ellsberg.net. When I first saw this piece of paper that said that the Joint Chiefs of Staff contemplated killing in Russia and China alone 325 million people and another 300 million from collateral damage elsewhere in the world, 600 million altogether, I thought it was the most evil plan, preparation that I could ever imagine, and that this, these preparations should not exist, this paper should not exist as, a, as, a, as an element of anyone's consciousness, that this should have happened, if at all, only inadvertently without anybody realizing what they were doing. But the idea that they understood that this would be the effect, and nevertheless were building more and more and more, was appalling. Now, at, appalling. At that point, by the way, no, uh, I was as against nuclear weapons then in the government as now, although I was still thought I was in, at that time involved in deterring Soviet attack, not knowing that in that year of 1961, the Russians did not have, it turned out, the thousand warheads that General Power of, of Strategic Air Command estimated they had, but four, four ICBMs at Plazet. So the problem of deterring them was not exactly what I had feared or thought that it was. It, we were on the wrong problem. I would say looking back, so my attitude on that has never changed. My attitudes on Vietnam and other matters, of course, changed a lot in the course of the years, but not on nuclear weapons. Now, at that thought time, I thought nothing could be more important for me in this than to help McNamara and Kennedy, who I felt, and I think rightly felt, abhorred nuclear weapons and the idea of first use as much as I did. And that, you know, helping them from inside was surely the best thing that could do. Uh, that was reasonable, but wrong. It was as wrong as, say, General Powers thinking that the best thing he could do, Powell, uh, the best thing he could do to avert a war on Iraq was to help the president answer Wolfowitz and so forth uh, inside while lying to the American public about what the issues really were. Uh, what could have been done, I regret very much that I didn't put that piece of paper out then and back it up with the studies that I had. I, I regret very much that I did not take the drawers full of nuclear estimates and proposals that I had in my safe at that time and put them out. I would certainly have gone to prison and I would probably still be in prison from that. I regret very much that I did not do that. And what I'm saying right now is that the people who understand the extreme inadequacy of this in terms of the threat of proliferation, the threat of terrorism which feeds on the proliferation and the, and the huge stockpiles that we have now, uh, in the face of these enormous threats to human survival, that's what's at stake here, uh, as it is uh, even more acutely than from climatic change. This mm -hmm. could happen <clears throat> tomorrow with a false alarm. So in view of those, I'm puzzled by one nobody has, in fact, just taken their safe full of documents, but I didn't do it at the time, so perhaps I shouldn't be so puzzled. But I am saying that I would like to see Congress demand, and they will not do so unless we demand of Congress, that they find out what this stuff is. I'll give one last concrete example. Senator Robert Kerry, who for other reasons is not one of my favorite, uh, is not a hero of mine, it so happens. But Robert Senator, Kerry. Robert Kerry, not John Kerry. Robert Kerry asked, in, uh, asked in, uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee to be briefed on the targeting policy, what I had worked on, the targeting policy of the United States in the PSYOP, the Single Integrated Operational Plan. He, he asked that repeatedly and was never, before he left the Senate, able to get that information. Now what I'm saying is he needed it, the Senate needs it, we need it, and we need not only what the targets are, but what will be the effects of using these weapons on these targets and the fact that they exist in the world today. It's never come out in any country. I was hoping that Gorbachev, if he'd stayed in power, mm -hmm. would be the one to have right. nuclear glasnost, but we need nuclear glasnost right now in this country. Uh, indeed. Now. May I ask the panelists to take us home with their best, briefest? What's, give us your briefest, 
best prescription for all of us uh, to, you know, give our grandchildren a world without nukes. How do we get there? You know, in terms of things to do, we, we, we know what to do. Uh, we need action, we need organization, we need protest, we need all of the other. After all, there's a thing called the Tea Party movement in the United States today. Uh, we don't come up to its knees uh, in terms of the effectiveness of what we're doing right now. It's not as if we don't know how to do it. Uh, it's been done many times before. We did it in the 1980s. So I don't have anything to add except just to do it. But I will add one thought, just a one-word thought uh, that I've mentioned before. And that is that the various elements of this danger and this opportunity need to be brought together into a single picture and related to one another. So the proliferation, disarmament, and so on are, are brought together. And once again, I think that, that the way to do that, there is a way to do that. There is a biological weapons convention which bans biological weapons on a global basis. There's a chemical weapon convention that does the same thing on a global uh, basis. There needs to be a nuclear weapon convention, and that needs to be at the center of thinking, organizing, and, and pulling this thing together. That, that, that would be my prescription. Can I? Well, th this is happily my cue to say you should be reading the bull. Best briefest. What, give us your briefest, best prescription for all of us uh, to, you know, give our grandchildren a world without nukes. How do we get there? You know, in terms of things to do, we, we, we know what to do. Uh, we need action, we need organization, we need protest, we need all of the other. After all, there's a thing called the Tea Party movement in the United States today. Uh, we don't come up to its knees uh, in terms of the effectiveness of what we're doing right now. It's not as if we don't know how to do it. Uh, it's been done many times before. We did it in the 1980s. So I don't have anything to add except just to do it. But I will add one thought, just a one-word thought uh, that I've mentioned before, and that is that the various elements of this danger and this opportunity need to be brought together into a single picture and related to one another. So the proliferation, disarmament, and so on are, are brought together. And once again, I think that, that the way to do that, there is a way to do that. There is a biological weapons convention which bans biological weapons on a global basis. There's a chemical weapon convention that does the same thing on a global uh, basis. There needs to be a nuclear weapon convention, and that needs to be at the center of thinking, organizing, and, and pulling this thing together. That, that, that would be my prescription. Can I? Well, th this is happily my cue to say you should be reading the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists um, at www.thebulletin.org, where you will find all the latest and the best analysis in ordinary, plain language uh, that you can uh, use, uh, read yourself, uh, click on a share with friends. Um, we can do all those kinds of things. I think more seriously, though, um, we just don't talk about these issues. And as I, I alluded to earlier, when, I, when people do, they say, well, I'm not an expert, but we are all experts about nuclear weapons. Uh, we have to be. This is uh, mass destruction without representation. Uh, and we all have, uh, if talking about tea parties, um, uh, this is uh, the most, in a way, democratic weapon there is. There's no discrimination. Everybody goes when this falls on us. And yet it's the most dictatorial weapon in its deployment. Only a very few make the decisions about it. It's not like the mobilization for war that we would have. Um, so this situation is unstable. And uh, we, need to, we need to tip the balance. And we need to do that by talking to one another about the, the uh, horribleness of the most dangerous technology on Earth. It is a terrific problem and one we all need to work on to solve. And it doesn't even have to be heroic. I mean, just go talk to people. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Can laughs> you I, know, that's all. Uh, we haven't mentioned nuclear waste. Did you want to give us a couple of lines of where we are here? In the Sure. There uh, actually is a new Blue Ribbon Commission on what to do about nuclear waste from nuclear, civilian nuclear 
power. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a problem, obviously. Um, the uh, current and best recommendation that we have from the scientists who work on this closely is that the storage of it now in what are called dry casks at the site of civilian nuclear uh, power plants will get us probably about 300 years of safely disposing of this. Yucca Mountain, uh, our, on our board, um, Allison McFarlane is a leading expert on Yucca Mountain. Uh, she's a geologist, doesn't think that it's a perfect place. There probably isn't a perfect place for nuclear waste. Um, I think there are some thoughts that if we invest in more fundamental science on nuclear science, that we may be able to find ways to um, d uh, d uh, kind of get this nuclear waste into to disappear and somehow, or at least use it in a way that um, uh, renders it, uh, if not safe, at least uh, safer. It is a problem. Uh, we've run scientists, uh, we won't get into the subject of the responsibility of scientists here, but it's a, certainly one that's on my mind a lot. Uh, and I think it, it is up to all of us to demand that these materials be carefully um, uh, dealt with and that we learn how to take care of mm -hmm. them so that they aren't harmful mm -hmm. to us. Right. Uh, okay. what, do you sh what do you tell your audiences as you make your way around? First, What's next? With, with each of the other panelists, everything they've said, and I will add to that that the culture of this country and, and really of the world at large about nuclear weapons has to be challenged and changed very fundamentally. This country is special in a certain sense, uh, not just because it used atomic weapons against Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as I say, we've used them since in a different way, but actually launched them against the weapon, but the fact that most Americans to this day have been misled to believe that the reasons and the discussion that led up to that justified their use, which is to say that we're a country that believes that the most greatest acts of terrorism in human history, and actually that was the second and third, the greatest was Tokyo firebombing on, uh, uh, in early in 1945, but that all of those were justified and legitimate. And when you start from that, it blinds you pretty much to the situation we're in humanly. But we're not the only ones who are pressing that now. The, if I can put it in context, I could hardly be more against what we are about to do in Afghanistan and have been doing in Iraq. But that, that is, that is in, that's an imperial war that's uh, quite comparable to what the Afghans themselves experienced time after time, uh, going back from the Soviets and the British, Genghis Khan, Alexander. They were all defeated, but defeated at the cost of great Afghan life. And uh, it's happened before, and it, we're, we're about to do it again to the Afghans, but that's an imperial war like the others. I don't think we really have come to grips with how different this is, what we're talking about. And when we say maintaining in this year nuclear winter capability on hair trigger alert which could have a false alarm as has happened in the past and come from any moment is a degree of horror I mean of, of a, a character of our species to allow this to happen that uh, really has to change somehow and it's not going to be changed by suggesting that these measures are at all adequate by the way if I felt confident that next year would be a quite different story. Uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be worried about this. Uh, so he got the health program through and he, he had to do this and he did that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have that confidence. I don't say it's impossible, but I think it is impossible without a different attitude in this country. And I'd sum it up, the bottom line is saying, it should not be the case that a presidential candidate 